So today's lecture is all about uh, cell phones or so mobile communication, mobile phones. And I put a question mark after the link layer because as you'll see, uh, cell phones actually encompass everything from the uh, physical layer, the link layer, all the way up to the application layer. In fact, SMS and MMS or text messaging is an application layer that runs on uh, cellular phones. So, uh, however, in the context of the internet or context of internet applications and so on, uh, the parts of the cell phone uh, stack that we'll use are the, uh, are the link. We really don't use too much about the link, so I'm going to focus on the link layer. Uh, again, I'm going to qualify that a little bit later on, but uh, for now, we're going to use treat it as a link layer. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of a history on cell phones. Uh, it's a pretty interesting history, and you'll understand a lot more about the technology once you understand the history. And then I'll go into the components, just like for Wi-Fi, what the components are, and the whole notion of a cell concept. You know, what, what is a cell? Why do why we use the word cell in the first place? And then the generations and cell phones, just like you have 802.11, Wi-Fi had A, B, G, N, A, C. Here we have generation 1, 2, 3, 4. I'll talk about that. And then uh, really here is where we dive a little bit into the technology of how you complete a call and how we do roaming and handovers. And then uh, if there's enough time, I'll go into a little bit on how the medium is accessed, so medium access protocols for cell phones. And then a little bit about SMS and MMS. So that's really what the, the structure is going to be today. Again, as with almost every other topic I'm covering, there's a lot of depth to it. Okay, uh, There's a huge amount of uh, information. If you ever feel like uh, you understand cell phones, all you need to, go, need to do is to go to Wikipedia and look up 4G. And if you can get, it, get past the first sentence, you already know a lot. Okay, because The first sentence has got 15 acronyms in it. And I thought I knew this stuff, and I looked at that. And even I didn't understand half the terms in there. Because there's this stuff, this stuff coming up all the time. There's new stuff happening. OK, let me start a little bit with the history. And you know, again, to set the stage here. Um, so when do you think cell phones are invented? You know, anybody have any ideas? When are the first cell phone calls made? Yeah. 1960. 1960. No. Yeah. Late 80s. Late 80s. Uh, no. <laughs> 70s. Okay, you can got to go back a little. <laughs> so uh, 1920s. Okay. And if you think about it, it's not super surprising. What's a cell phone really? Okay, you have a radio, right? Transistor radio. You turn it on, listen to radio station. What if you had a transmitter as well? So you have a small transmitter, and so you have basically you know a transmitter and a receiver. You got you got cell phones, basically it. So as soon as radio, uh, as soon as radio transmitters were shrunk down to reasonable size, which means the size of a trailer, okay, you could have a cell phone. All right. And that's exactly how it was done. It was used by police, right? If you think about it, police have had uh, radio communication for quite a long time. And if the police can have it, presidents and prime ministers have it too, right? So if you're rich enough or could afford it, uh, you could have your own cell phone. So it started out. Incidentally, uh, uh, most people are amazed at the first video conference. You know, video conference with sound and not wireless, but wired. Do you know when the first video conference was? Anybody want to guess? 50s, earlier. <laughs> it was in 1927. The president of Bell Labs, president of AT&T, and the president of the US had a video conference in 1927 because the Bell Labs had just invented the TV camera. Again, it's the same thing. If you have a TV camera, you can have a video conference, right? It's not a big deal. TV camera plus a phone line. And of course, AT&T had phone lines. They had lots of phone lines. So when I talk about video conferencing, I tell them it happened in 1927. People are just blown away. But these are really fairly old technologies. Um, fax actually goes back also a very long time ago. Fax goes back to the 1920s as well. Anyway, between 1920 and 1980, nothing much happened. Okay. There, was, there were phones, but the problem was that when you transmit on a radio frequency, you take up the whole frequency. right? If you have a radio station transmitting at 98.5 FM, Guess what? Nobody else can use 98.5 FM in the whole area. So yeah, if you're the president, you can have it. But it was rather unlikely that everybody could carry 98.5 FM in their pocket, right? So that was a problem. 
What happened in the 80s, specifically 1982, was that the invention of the cell concept, which we'll talk about in, in some more detail, but the cell concept you can think of as basically limiting the range of your radio stations. So it doesn't broadcast very far, right? The, 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 so if you've ever driven uh, towards Stratford on Route 7, okay, you'll see this very tall tower on the hill, okay? That's the TV tower. That actually gets all the region of Waterloo. And it's about a 100 meter tall tower, you know, it's very long. Those stars can reach 50, 60 kilometers, okay, depending on terrain and so on. Uh, these smaller radio stations that you see are triangle-shaped platforms, like so. They almost exactly look like this. And they're sitting on top. If anybody, has anybody seen these kind of platforms along the 401 or on building? That's a cell phone uh, tower, okay? These stars have a much smaller range. In, in open country, they're about 30 kilometers, but actually in urban areas, they have a reach of as little as 250 meters, okay, just 250 meters, which means that uh, you don't need to own the spectrum, you don't need to own the frequency band everywhere. And, and, and as I said, that's a cell concept, we'll come to that in a minute. But at any rate, in 1982, people figured this out, specifically Motorola figured it out, and they said, you know what, we have enough technology, enough electronics for us to build a, a portable cell phone. So portable cell phone was a suitcase-like thing about this big, a little bit bigger, and then a handset, which only weighed two kilos. You know, it was really small. <laughs> Compared to a trailer, it was really small. And uh, it, the airtime cost about $5 a minute, something like that, it was pretty expensive. And uh, to cut kind a of long story short, uh, the, there was enough money in it, and uh, that, the, that there was, uh, uh, proliferation of technology and the ability to shrink things down. The big breakthrough happened with the European Union. With the, 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 in, in the EU, in Europe, the mobile operators came up with a standard called GSM. It stands for Group System Mobile, but basically a system for mobile whatever, mobile access. And the GSM standard had many, many innovations, and we'll actually talk about some of them in a little bit. But in particular, what it allowed people to do was to build to a protocol or a standard where once you built the GSM, you could use it anywhere. So you could be a manufacturer in a little town in, northern, in, in southern Finland, and you could sell to everybody in Europe. And in fact, a little town in southern Finland uh, called Espoo was the home of Nokia, which actually was a lumber mill operator. They used to you know, cut down trees, because that's what they had in Finland. All they had were trees. So they cut it down and made it into, into lumber and sold it. But these guys said, hey, you know what? Uh, with this GSM stuff, we can build cell phones instead, and that became Nokia. Okay? Uh, other companies also got into it, uh, Ericsson, also in uh, Norway, or Ericsson, Sweden, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but that allowed interoperability. You could buy a phone anywhere, you could sell it anywhere. And also, the another thing that happened was GSM could allow one frequency to be shared by eight people at a time. So suddenly, instead of getting $1 per minute, as you're getting, you could get $8 per minute. And what, guess what you could do with that? You could do a lot of advertising. Okay. And so suddenly there's a lot more money coming in. That allowed people to develop more technologies. And so the efficiency, how many people can you fit into a certain amount of spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, increased and increased and increased till now we have actually reached uh, very high densities. Okay, I won't get into the technology, but let's just say it's about 15 to 20 times denser than it used to be. And the quality is more or less the same. And so uh, this has allowed a huge proliferation of, of, uh, of cell phones. So there have been many generations of cell phones. So the first generation was analog, just two radio stations, and you know, it evolved a little bit. Today we're at what's called 4G. We're just about to get into 4G, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, the number of cell phones in the world is quite astounding. So anybody have any idea how many cell phones there are? A billion? Mm, higher. <laughs> Something like that, about five billion or so. And uh, some countries, the penetration of cell phones has been uh, truly amazing. I'll give you two examples. Uh, one example is Somalia. So as many people know, Somalia is actually not even a country in the sense that they don't actually even have a government, okay? They don't have a government, but they have cell phones. And the reason is because each tribal leader puts up a cell phone tower like this, and then around it, they put a, a barbed wire fence and they have people with machine guns to. And then over here, they have a diesel generator and tanks of fuel. And guess what? If you do this and you have a link to somebody else, which is typically a long-distance link to Kenya, okay, you have cell phone service. And the people who want to 
use cell phones, they buy a cell phone from somewhere and they charge it by using you know, bicycle generators or whatever. Uh, and, uh, but they can provide cell phone service and they do. And guess what, if you don't pay the bill, you have very, you're in very bad trouble, okay? You better pay your bills on time. So they, they actually seem to be doing just fine. And so one of the world's fastest growth rates in cell phone is a percentage in Somalia. And it's uh, really fascinating to see how you can have you know, a perfectly legitimate business without uh, having any government. And of course, they pay no taxes, and there's no government, there's no tax. So that's kind of nice, I guess. Yeah. The other place uh, which I have some experience with is in India. And I remember when the cell phones were first introduced in India, it was about 1997 or so, uh, not very long ago. And uh, the, the airtime was very expensive, it was about $1.65 to $2 a minute, okay, so it's very, very small penetration. And then suddenly what happened was that the government said, we're gonna remove all barriers to entry, anybody who wants to can come and use it, and we're gonna get competition in, okay? And so from going from uh, $2 a minute roughly, uh, now uh, it's about 0 0.5 cents a minute to use in India. And every month, every month, they sell about 20 million cell phones. New, 20 million new subscribers join every month. So the government, from 1947 when they got independence to 1997, in 50 years, the total penetration of telephony into India was about 2%. It means 2% of India had phones, that was it. So when they did this in uh, 2001, is when they did this, they had this grand plan that 2010, they'll get to 20%, okay? But 20 by 2010, actually they're up to about 70%, uh, I believe, and uh, Maybe not 70%, 50, whatever it is. So their plan is to get to 100% by 2015, and they're going to actually beat it by a couple of years because at these prices, you can't not have a cell phone. It's just too cheap. So I was once uh, visiting India, and I was visiting a small university there, and I was in the banks of this river, and a camel herder went by. You know, camel herders are like goat herders, except they herd camels, you know, and you can ride on them. So he's riding on this camel. It was very scenic, you know, very picturesque, wearing a turban and all this stuff. I said, oh, this is very cool. And he takes, takes a cell phone out of his pocket and starts calling somebody. I said, okay, you know, this is really what you mean by universal penetration. Even camel herders have cell phones. So that's the history of it, and that's where things are going, where um, uh, cell phone penetration is basically going to be close to 100%, right, as far as I can make out. And prices are going to drop as long as, as long as the government gets out of the way and doesn't you know, prevent people from entering. So in Canada, for example, we have a pretty bad situation in that the government prevents the entry of uh, carriers. You might say, oh, how come Verizon and Deutsche Telekom and Sprint are in the US, but you can't get those companies to uh, provide you service here? You can only get Rogers, Bell, or Telus. Well, that's because the government prevents them from coming in because they're American-owned and you need to be Canadian-owned to be competing in Canada. So we pay amongst the highest cell phone rates in the world, okay, amongst the highest. Uh, in fact, very few countries pay higher. Switzerland pays higher, I think, and maybe a few others, a handful of others. And uh, whereas other countries where you have, you know, essentially open competition, uh, your pri the prices go low because there's nothing that stops you from keeping the prices from being low, just the government getting in the way. All right, so I'll talk more about that in the second break. <laughs> I'll talk about my personal history with that. But this is the history of cell phones in a nutshell. So from a niche technology uh, owned only by kings and emperors, you know, down to where, you know, camel herders in the middle of nowhere have it. And that's a huge sort of technology success story. And it's a success story in other ways as well in that people who have cell phones who traditionally have been unable to communicate can. And actually it improves the quality of life dramatically, okay, uh, as you can imagine. Okay, having set the stage there, let's look a little bit into the components. What goes into a cell phone? Um, to understand how cell phones work, you need to understand it's actually an extension of the phone network. Okay, it's not part of the internet really. It's actually a separate network altogether. A telephone network, is very complex and I really won't go into it. However, I will talk about one concept, which is this notion of area. And area is a geographically close set of phone numbers, just like a geographically close set of IP addresses. For example, you have the 519 area, which is where we're at. And these connect to, let's think of it as a core network, just like the internet core, this is a telephony core. And then the different areas sort of hanging off of it. Like you can have the 416 area, which is in uh, Toronto, and 905, and so on, okay? So, 
And uh, you kind of recognize this from your phone numbers. If you have a 405, sorry, 416, or a 519, et cetera, you kind of know it belongs to a particular geographical area. Nothing new about that. The way, this, the reason it's important is because this is how phones, cell phones plug into the whole infrastructure is that instead of having a telephone at home connected by wire to what's called a central office, so this is the central office, and you essentially have a wire from your home to the central office. It's actually a wire, okay? It's not wireless, it's actually wire going through from every home to central office. And if you've been in the central office, you'll see what are called the cable vault, and it's one kind of a, on the floor, you have roughly 100,000 wires coming in, okay, into the central office. It's pretty amazing to see that there's this, this mass of, wires coming out of the ground into these uh, what are called distribution racks. But at any rate, that's, why, that's, where, the, that's where these uh, phones are. Instead of having this, what happens is that the central office is connected to a tower, a cell phone tower, like so, okay, using a wire or using a wireless connection. And this provides coverage in some geographical area. And here is your cell phone now, which is connected uh, wirelessly to that particular uh, tower, and so this is called the base station. Okay, and that's the uh, uh, cent uh, central office. There's one more. There's one more element, element that I'll come to in a, in, in, a, in a bit when I talk about call completion. But uh, I'm going to leave this picture up. I'm going to draw this line over here. But I'm going to label that later. Okay, that's the other part that's going to be involved in this whole uh, business over here. Okay, so the components are really a cell phone, the base station, it looks a lot like a Wi-Fi network interface card and a Wi-Fi access point, and it is in fact rather similar in that pers perspective. Except that when you do Wi-Fi, it's at the link layer, and then you don't, you know, network layer which is typically I don't know, IP and TCP and so on, but as a cell phone, you actually have an app that's built in from the ground up, which is voice, okay. So the original cell phone was a voice phone, and it had only voice, right? And and that reflects when you come to the generations. But, uh, the, uh, but so you have an application, sort of the default application is voice, and then you have other applications as well that are run on these smartphones, which came a bit later. So this, these are the elements, the cell phone, the base station, the central office, and then uh, you know, symmetrically you have central offices at other locations and other towers and, uh, and so on, and other coverage areas, so that's how the pieces over here. Any questions about this so far? Yeah. Mm, so each tower only uh, serves like one area. Correct. Yeah. Oh, not one area, one small coverage area. From the same central office, you have connections to multiple towers. Okay, and each of them covers this. But they yeah. only have like one area. One, one small, yeah, the area, I'm going to use that for the, for the area code, okay. right? So I wouldn't call that an area. Uh, you can think of it as the coverage area for that base station. So yeah, and they overlap. Right, they do overlap, and then each phone typically would select the strongest signal from there. So at the University of Waterloo, we can see six base stations. From most parts of campus, we can see six. That's unusual because we have RIM next to us, and so RIM has their own like proprietary cell, cell towers, and once in a while, they put up a special cell tower in the back of the building. You can see it as you go past the tracks. Most places, we'll see about three or four. Uh, six is pretty unusual, but okay. Any other questions about this? Yeah, okay, so let me talk about the cell concept and then we'll take a, a break. So what is the cell concept anyway? And the idea is like this. The, the, the typical drawing is to draw what's called a beehive-like structure with a bunch of hexagons. So am I doing this right? Yeah. Huh. And hypothetically what happens is we're going to cover the surface of any, particular, any area in, with these uh, hexagons, and we put a cell tower in the middle of each of them. And I'm just going to draw a couple more because I need that to explain. My drawings are getting terrible, okay. Something like that, okay. Whatever, okay. Remember that with the first wireless telephone, the problem was that if you allocated somebody a frequency, you know, let's use 98.5 as an example, it would cover the whole 50 kilometers, so nobody else could use it. The cell concept is what's called the frequency reuse concept. And what it says is that I can use 98.5 here, and in the surrounding area, which is this whole surrounding cells, okay, if I do this properly, it'd be six 
surrounding cells, one corresponding to each edge. In these areas, in this surrounding area, can't use 98.5. Okay, but in the other guys, which are over here, you can use 98.5 again. Okay? Do you see what I mean? It's far enough away that it's not going to cause interference. And it's just like saying that if you have 98.5 in the radio dials in Waterloo, you can certainly have it in Rochester, you can have it in Syracuse, you can have it in Thunder Bay because it's too far away, it doesn't really matter. That's a free frequency reuse concept. In a cell phone, what happens is that we uh, have smaller coverage areas. And again, it's the actual coverage maps, the actual areas like this are not hexagons. They are you know, amoebas, they look really funny. Uh, but uh, they do uh, carefully plan the frequency reuse to make sure that neighbors don't use the same frequency. Okay, and that's basically why it's called a cell phone because the 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 uh, allocation of frequencies is such that in each cell you have a non-interference from the neighboring cells. So that's the cell over here. Now this has a very important consequence, which is that if you have a road that goes like so, like the 401, all right, there's a car driving on this road, okay, so it's going to be, at, uh, if it's, you have a call, it's going to be 98.5, this could be 96.7, you're going to have to change your frequency from here to here, all right? You're going to have to keep changing the frequency as you drive past, and this is what's called handover. We'll discuss how handover is done in a minute, but this is the, this is the situation here. So you can't just keep your radio tuned to the same dial. Again, this happens with your regular FM radio as well. As you drive to Toronto, listening to CBC, you're at a particular frequency. When you go past Cambridge, you're going to change because you know, you're listening to Toronto instead, so your frequency changes. Right? Same idea over here, except that it happens much faster, especially if you're driving because the cells are going to come, you're going to go past cells roughly one every minute or two minutes. So every two minutes you're doing a handover, another handover, another handover, and so on. Okay? So that's why it's called a cell phone. At least in North America it's called cell phone. Rest of the world it's called a mobile phone. Of course they use the cell concept, but you know, that's just terminology over here. Okay, so remember it's not really hexagons. To give you an example of you know, what it would look like, if you have like a mountain valley, mountain and a valley and a longish valley like you see in British Columbia in a Kelowna, the cell would actually be long and go along the valley because it doesn't go through mountains. So whenever you have any kind of topological features, the hills and surrounding areas will compress the radio waves and kind of shape it into funny shapes. And they spend a lot of money and a lot of time modeling this and figuring out where the propagation is happening so that you can get a, a good signal. And in, in, in terrain, which is uh, mountainous, you know, ups and downs, hills and valleys, you have very poor coverage because it's not economically uh, worthwhile for you to put cell towers everywhere, and so you'll often have things cut off. Okay, there won't be any coverage here. It's particularly interesting <laughs> that uh, uh, the area to the uh, south and west of Silicon Valley, which is kind of the hilly part of uh, hilly part of uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, is where all the rich venture capitalists live because they live up in the hills in these beautiful huge houses, and they have no cell phone coverage. Okay, <laughs> because uh, uh, you know, they, 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 I mean, the companies don't, have, they don't want to put up uh, cell towers there. So, so the richer you are, the less coverage you have, and it's almost a uh, mark of Lego. Like, oh, I'm so rich, I don't have cell coverage at home. It's like, okay, <laughs> all right, I get it, okay. All right, so that's the cell concept. Any questions on that? Okay, good. So we'll continue with generations after the break. Okay, let's go into the generations. Uh, you've often seen ads for, you know, 1G, 2G, well, 3G, 4G. Now Apple announced the new iPad and said, oh, it's 4G compatible, and there's a whole bunch of acronyms after that, LTE, HSDPA, UMTS, AD, you know. Oh. So <laughs> you've got to love these guys, you know. Every week there's a new acronym and you wonder what it means. I'm not going to go too many, into too many acronyms. What I am going to do is to give you like a high-level summary of what each generation means and what, what is introduced. So the, uh, each generation is a marketing term. Okay? It's not a technology term. So when you say 1G or 2G or 3G or 4G, it's got something to do with technology. It's got a lot more to do with marketing which means that 
there is the industry association, and then there's the ITU, the International Teletraffic Union, which sort of says, if you meet these requirements, it's okay to call yourself 4G, all right? But if you fall short on one, then what do you do? So they call it 3.9G or 3.5G, which is complete, I mean, it's not, it's not defined. So, well, I meet all the criteria, but it's, well, okay, I'm gonna call this a three point. So you have 1G, 2G, 3G, but you have 2.5, 3, 3.4, 3.9, 4, you know, who knows what. Right, so these are all marketing terms, so uh, you should be pretty uh, wary of somebody saying it's 4G. It sort of just means that they sort of kind of meet the requirements on a good day, okay. And uh, so, okay, don't trust them. There is some difference between the first, second, third, and fourth generation. We'll talk about those now. But then, you know, when you get into what's the difference between 3.5 and 3.9 and 4, but not quite 4, okay, that's getting into too much detail and I won't do that. So the first generation is analog. And the analog phones were the ones that were being used essentially until about 99, 2000. And what would happen is that if this is a cell, so if you're going to convert that into a hexagon, to be con you know, so then you would have adjacent cells used essentially what amounted to FM, okay, but it was analog. And so what would happen is that in each cell, instead of having just one frequency, there would be a set of about five or six frequencies. If I remember correctly, there were six, maybe seven frequencies. It doesn't matter, small number of frequencies. So these frequencies are allocated here. Each phone could use one of those set of frequencies, and we'll see how that got allocated in a moment. And these would use a different set of frequencies, but down here, which is uh, far enough away, this frequency and this frequency set could be the same, okay? It was analog, okay? And that was what was done. And so the number of users essentially was, number of simultaneous users in a cell was essentially the same as the number of frequencies that were there, okay? So uh, what happens if you have a user enter a cell because they drove in and all the frequencies are used up? What would happen? The call gets dropped, right? So that's what a handover problem. You go there, you say, hey, I'm here. Give me a frequency. Oops, no frequency, okay? So, so that was a problem. So the first generation was purely analog and um, went away. So what happened was the second generation was they said, let's improve the frequency reuse. So we're going to keep these frequencies, but what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and pack people in more. And what they did was they introduced basically frequency division multiplexing, which is those frequencies plus time division multiplexing. And what that meant was that you divided time into eight slots. This is, I'm talking about the GSM standard now. And there's another standard, but not as important. Four, five, six, seven, eight. So what would happen is that each frequency, so remember there were seven or so frequencies. Each frequency had these eight slots in it. And when a phone was registered to the base station, associated with the base station, it would be given two frequencies and corresponding time slots. Why? Because uh, one was for talking up to the base station, one's for coming down, right? So you're going to talk both ways. So you would get a particular frequency. So you'd say, oh, use frequency number one, time slot four. And then what would happen is that this base station over here would be sending out a time signal. If you remember HE so talking about say one, two, three, four, that was a time signal. That time signal is coming from the base station. And so each cell phone would say, okay, I'm going to slot four. In slot four, it would either receive or transmit, depending on whether it's allocated for uplink or downlink. And uh, this way they would share the, frequency, the frequencies and they would share the time slots, okay? And right away you can see that this multiplies the number of users in a base in, in an area by eight, okay? Because now you can have eight people in each cell and you don't have to use it. So by introducing the time division multiplexing, you get much more efficiency. And this actually is the beginning of the cell phone upsurge because suddenly you could pack more people in and you didn't need to use any more spectrum. Okay, the spectrum was allocated to you by the government or you bought it from them, but for the same amount of, it's like taking, I mean, imagine you're a landlord who owns an apartment, okay? You're charging somebody $200 a month as rent. Through some magical thing, which means you tell them you're allowed to sleep in your apartment only one day a week, 
You can pack seven people in and still charge them $200 a month. Suddenly your rent goes up from $200 a month to $1,400 a month, right? You're pretty happy. You can start putting out ads you know, in the daily record saying, come on and rent an apartment from me. You, know, you, get, you only have to pay $200. Bucks. Well, that's what happened over here. So the prices went down, penetration went up because you could do TDM. So this was a big deal, and that was because of GSM. The, uh, and GSM was a huge success because of that. Okay. Uh, did 1G have two frequencies for up and down? That's correct. You would get, so that's why you had a bunch of frequencies allocated, so you would be going to a particular up frequency and a particular down frequency. Yeah. Clarence. So does that uh, time division multiply? Does that mean when one guy is, is one guy's turn, the other guy's can be there? That's correct, yeah. So you would have to wait for your time slot, and then you would use that time slot. So what would happen is that uh, the, the, uh, whatever you speak would be uh, sent during that little bit of time, but this is happening pretty fast. You, you don't notice that you're not getting the air all the time. Okay, so I'm, I'm skipping quite a bit of technology here, but let's just say that uh, you, you, you buffer up your speech and then you send it out over here. Okay. So it's a, it's a digital standard, right? It's not an analog standard anymore. So you speak. And let's say 20, 20 milliseconds or so worth of speech, you put in a buffer, because I'm going to do an analog to digital conversion, then I send those bits in a burst during that time. Okay, I should add that this is uh, digital. Okay, so that, that made all the difference. So, oh, the other thing that was the difference between analog uh, 1G and 2G was with 1G with analog, anybody could hear anybody else's calls. You just tune your radio station, you could listen to everybody else's calls. With 2G, uh, with digital, you, compre you, you, you encrypted it so you couldn't scan other people's calls. So that was an added benefit as well. Okay? So higher density, and the higher density was achieved by going digital and using time division multiplexing. Okay? And this was quite popular. In fact, 2G is still being used in some rural areas and so on. It's uh, uh, not super common, but it's still there. The next generation was 3G, and the main the difference in 2G and 3G is 3G is basically data oriented. And what I mean by that is that on 2G, to use data, if you wanted to surf the web on your cell phone uh, in the, let's say 2002 or 2003, so has anybody tried using that, doing that? So if, if you guys remember using those old feature phones, uh, Nokia feature phones, if you can try to surf the web, you would get a text screen and it would be incredibly painful, incredibly slow, and you'd be charged a lot of money for it. That's because this voice channel was converted into a data channel, and they had to jump through many, many hoops for this to happen, and uh, it, it was pretty bad. Okay, the data rates were very low, about eight kilobits per second, 24, uh, or maybe in some cases, 16 kilobits per second, and uh, it was really converting voice to data and using the data channels. So it was not meant for data, it was meant for voice, and they kind of hacked it to give you data. Okay? The 3G standard said, look, we realize that there's going to be smartphones, let's make it data oriented, not just voice. And so uh, it preserves the structure over here. However, and again, I'm not going to go into uh, details, the uh, 3G allows you to do data natively. You can do data quite easily. Okay, so it's, and in fact, what happens is that the uh, voice channels and data channels are cleanly separated, and which is why you can get a voice plan separate from a data plan. So you can buy a, a BlackBerry or an iPhone with a data plan, only data, with 3G, but you can't do that with 2G. In 2G, you get data as part of voice, whereas here, you have data separate and voice separate and separate plans. And they use separate parts of the spectrum and so on. So uh, this, is, this is the big difference between 2G and 3G. And then 4G, which is just about coming up, is all IP. It's all based on IP. In fact, it's IPv6 is what some providers have. For example, if you use Verizon, you're using only IPv6. But it's only kind of internally it's using IPv6. I just wrote IPv6 down there, Kevin. So, so that's the uh, main uh, focus of of, uh, of uh, 4G. The other thing is that the data rates have gone up. For 3G, the uh, data rate, the peak rate, is, approx is approximately 2 megabit, uh, sorry, 200 kilobits per second. With 4G, uh, you can go up to peak, so it's up to 
500 megabits per second. Sorry, a peak is up to let's see, one gigabit per second downlink, and uh, and 500 megabits per second up. I mean that's huge, right? If you look at the DSL modem, you're talking about a downlink of 10 megabits per second, maybe 20 if you're paying a lot. With 4G, the technology allows you, and this is where you have to be careful. If you're the only user in the cell, and the, you know, you're standing next to the cell tower, you can, in theory, get a gigabit per second down, and 500 megabit per second up, okay? In fact, it's gonna be shared by all the other users, so your actual uplink and downlink rates in 4G are likely to be a lot lower, but they're still in the 10 megabit per second range. So with 4G modems, you don't need DSL or cable modem at home. You can just throw it out, Put in your 4G modem wherever you are, and that's it, you go, you're done. You can have a hotspot wherever you want. You can get data connectivity wherever you want at those rates, which are basically broadband rates. So 4G is what's also called mobile broadband. And so it's a, again, it's a technological breakthrough. A lot of very sophisticated algorithms have gone into 4G, and it's just beginning to be rolled out. So 4G, I said, is a marketing term. The underlying technologies that are being used uh, the, that you would see would be called LTE advanced. So if you see LTE advanced, then that LTE stands for long-term evolution advanced. And uh, I think that's, uh, or it's called IMT advanced. Those are the two current technologies which are qualified to be called 4G. Pretty much everything else today is going to be 3G. Uh, over here, and these are you know, pretty amazing rates. Of course, they're not going to stop there. There's going to be a 5G probably two, three years down the line, a 6G and so on. But uh, these are pretty impressive rates. Now you know why municipal Wi-Fi is dead. Okay, why bother? Right? Wi-Fi can get you at 100 megabit per second uh, with a lot of trouble in these very bad bands. In contrast with 4G, you're in a very nice band, the 1.8 gigahertz band or the 700 megahertz band. And these bands are beautiful, very nice spectrum, you know, very little interference, no absorption by water or buildings and so on. And uh, the cell phone companies, of course, have to pay a lot for it. Okay? So just to give you an example, when the 3G bands were auctioned in Europe in 2000, 2000 and 2001, something like that, they uh, were auctioned for $40 billion. Okay? The 700 megahertz spectrum in the US was auctioned two years ago, and I think the bids are in roughly $10 billion or so. That's roughly what it was for. And in Canada, the auction's gonna happen, you can expect you know, like a billion, or do a billion dollar plus bids. That's what it's going for, okay? The, and uh, so it's very good spectrum. It's not like the ISM spectrum. Okay, that's all I want to say about generations because I really want to get into the technology uh, right now. Any questions about this over here? Yeah. What is the up and down? Oh, up means from mobile to base station, and down is like that. And down is always faster than up because you have more power here, because you have a generator or something like that. And up, you have less power, so up is always going to be less speeds. Okay, the more power you have, the faster you can go, basically. Any other questions? Okay, so let's take a look at how this thing actually works, and I'm going to refer to this figure now. And uh, so as you can see, the, the, the main, uh, okay, so let me actually erase this because I need the space here. Okay, let's think about the following problem. We have the cell phone over here, which has some number, okay? And, uh, it, it, it was outside a coverage area, let us say, and it moved into this coverage area. So it was out, out of coverage, moved into here, and somebody is calling this phone, all right? Somebody somewhere else in the world is calling this phone, and we want the phone to ring, okay? What all needs to happen, right? Okay, so the first thing is that this phone needs a number, right? It needs a number, because when you buy a phone, it's just kind of without any number attached to it. So how do you get a number? Yeah? You get, a SIM card. you get a SIM card, right? So the SIM card, the SIM stands for subscriber identification module. Okay. 
and it's a little card which contains in it uh, essentially a number, which is a hard-coded number, and the number has a name, again, another acronym for you, the IMSI, which is the, I'm not gonna write, International Mobile Subscriber Identifier. You don't need to know this, but it's, uh, it's uh, a number which is engraved on that SIM card, okay, and can't be changed, okay, or can't be easily changed. <laughs> Everything can be changed if you're willing to buy an electron microscope and move the bits around or move the atoms around, but it's hard to change without an electron microscope. So IMSI is what you get when you go to uh, you know, like a Conestoga Mall and you go to the guy and you say, I want a SIM card, they give you a SIM card. And this SIM card, when put into the phone, gives it a number. Before that, it didn't have a number. And that is protected by hardware. So basically, if the SIM card is in here, that number is now part of the phone. Okay, and the phone can trust the SIM card, it's not been tampered with. Okay. If you put a different SIM card in, it changes the number, right? And that's why if you want to lend somebody a phone, you take out the SIM card, you lend the phone to them, they put their SIM card and it becomes theirs. Okay. So that's, that's what happens. Now, this SIM card with this IMSI actually is going to be registered with the central office and with a database. And this database is called the Home location register, and that's why when you get the phone, there's a call that they make back to the home office. And what it has is this SIM card number, the IMSI, and it has your credit card number, okay? So that when you make a call, they can bill you for it. Remember that with the internet, what happens, how do you get an IP address? You go to, you put your, you put your uh, laptop in a Wi-Fi hot zone and DHCP gives you an IP address. You don't have to put a credit card number anywhere, right? They just give you an address and you're happy to you can start using it. You can't use the cell phone network unless you pay. So you've got to have the IMSI <coughs> registered to the home location register and the, it's called a location register, you'll see why in a moment. But basically, the home location register, for now, you can think of as having a mapping from the number to the credit card, okay? And it's your home. All right. Now we're almost done. We get the phone. It has a number. And now this base station needs to basically know that you, which is num the cell phone with this number, exist in its coverage area, okay? And so what happens is this. This cell phone uh, tower is constantly putting out a beacon, just like a Wi-Fi beacon, it's putting out a beacon. It's actually putting out several beacons, okay, but we'll, I'll talk on these two of them. One of them is a beacon that says, this is my ID, and you know, and uh, the beacon is put on a well-known frequency. All cell stations use the same frequency. So no matter what your talk frequency is, this frequency is the announcement frequency, everybody uses the same, so the phone is kind of hardwired into the phone, you're listening on that frequency, and you're saying, okay, who is it? And there's something called the pilot channel, which tells you the signal strength. So you have this little bar that shows you what the signal strength is, that's coming on the pilot frequency. So, so this is broadcasting, this is broadcasting, and the phone listen to all, listens to all of them, it picks the strongest channel, and it says, okay, I want to associate with the strongest channel, and basically it sends a message to the base station saying, here's my IMSI, you know, and register me, okay? So now this phone number, this base station knows exists, okay, it's associated with it, and it puts it into, it tells the home location register, okay, your phone, you know, this phone is over here, I'm responsible for it, and actually it's not stored in the home location, it's stored in something called the visitor location register, that's where the, it's another database, and the VLR is actually what holds this information about which cell uh, uh, tower has this particular phone, right? So, so you tell, you, you listen to the pilot, you figure out this thing, figure the strongest signal, send a message to it, and then it says, okay, I'm gonna send a message to the central office. Central office says, phone number, whatever, 519 something, 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 is at cell tower number 20, let us say, and that information is kept, okay? This is done even if your phone is not being used. The closest cell tower knows where you are all the time. So, if you commit a crime, take off the battery from your cell phone, okay? Well, begin with, don't commit a crime, but if you do and you don't want to be tracked, take the cell phone battery out, 
Okay, because if you remember this case about the astronaut's wife who traveled across the US and you know, went and killed somebody and drove back, every single step of the way they knew where she was because the cell phone towers had these messages coming all the time saying, here, this is my uh, uh, IMSI, which is unforgeable, and I'm at this location. Okay, it's like leaving a fingerprint wherever you go. Okay, it's, uh, so at least, uh, okay, so don't commit crimes, okay. <laughs> But at least now you know, okay? You are being tracked. If you have a phone in your pocket, you're being tracked. Not for any nefarious purposes, but just because somebody somewhere is gonna call you. So somebody somewhere calls the 519 number, okay? And this message, it's not a voice message. It's a signaling message. It's a message that I want to talk to somebody, right? It's a different message. And actually it's sent on a different network. It doesn't go on the voice network, it goes on a, something called a signaling network. I'll talk about that in a minute. And it goes through the core to the 519 area, to the central office of the 519 area. The 519 area code, it says, okay, this looks like a cell number to me. How does it know it looks like a cell number to me? Because a certain range of numbers in the 519 are mobile numbers. And a certain range are not. It's hard-coded. Right? So it looks at the number and says 519-884, oh, that's a landline. All right, I'm going to send it to a landline. 519, whatever, 765, that's a mobile number. It goes to the HLR first and says, I just got a call for a mobile. Has he paid the bills? Or has she paid the bills? If not, you get a message saying, yeah, this guy hasn't paid the bill, deadbeat. I'm not going to complete the call. Okay? But you've paid the bills. It comes back, goes to the VLR, and says, which tower is this phone at? And it says, oh, it's in tower 20. All right, no problem. It sends a message to tower 20 and says, hey, this phone needs to ring. Send a control message on a different channel. It's not the pilot channel anymore. It's a signaling channel. On that channel, it sends a message saying, ring the phone. So that message goes here. This phone is always listening to the signaling channel. It's listening there. When it gets a signaling message, it says, ring the phone. So it rings the phone, and you pick it up, unless you're in class, in which case you turn it off. <laughs> so that's how you get found. So as you move to a different coverage area, what happens is that you realize on the pilot channel that the signal strength from this has gone down, and this is higher. So what you do is you first associate with the other base station, the same exactly, send a message saying, here I am, this is my IMSI, please register me with your tower. You associate, and then you dissociate from there. So it's make, then break, okay? So this way you don't get lost. Now of course it could be the case, you go and you try to make, and it says, sorry, I'm full up, I can't, I can't handle any calls. In which case, you know, you know you're gonna drop the call, okay? But if, you, if you're in the call, that's okay. While you're in the call, you make, and then when you got connected, then you switch your voice over here, and the central office switches its voice over here, and that's the handover process, okay? And then when you've done that, then you break the old connection, and you continue talking. And this all happens within a few milliseconds, okay? So when you're driving on the 401, as you hand over, you don't even probably notice that you had a handover happen. It happens, you know, like 10, 20 milliseconds, very fast. And that's the beauty of this technology. It's just painless, yeah. So if you can't take your battery out of your phone, yeah. is it the same if you take out your SIM card then? Uh, yeah, if you take out the SIM card, it would be, uh, well, there's a little bit more to it than that. There's actually two IDs in your phone. One is the phone's own ID, which is uh, called the, it's not the IMSI, it's called something else, which is the, I bigger party? IMEI. IMEI, thank you. International Mobile Equipment Identifier. And the IMEI is in the phone. Okay, okay it says, I am this phone. And if you take the SIM card, it's still there. <laughs> Yeah. So, you don't ask me too many questions. I'm getting worried. <laughs> <right now. laughs> okay, tell me. So is there like another signaling network in order to implement CDMA? Like Verizon is CDMA, there's no SIM cards. Uh, yeah. Like right. So without the system of GSM over here, CDMA with a different technology, the, uh, uh, the uh, hardware identifier is still there. But, you, but it's like the IMEI is always there, and then the association between the hardware and the user is done in the back office database. You can't change the identity by using a SIM card, but the, basically the same idea. The IMEI 
is used to look up everything rather than the IMSI. So the phone's hardware identifier is being used in the back end. That's why if you have a CDMA phone and you give it to somebody who's in a different operator, it won't work. They can't because it's got to be changed in the back end database to say that this EI belongs to this credit card number. Right, so, so, but the SIM card is nicer in that sense because you can actually swap identities. Okay. Some other question, yeah, Victor? Um, so the App Store has an application called Find My iPhone. So you basically use uh, Suiki Network for wireless to track your, the location of your iPhone, right? Yeah. So uh, why can't we use, just use a cell phone tower to control the phone? Like for the users. Oh, so what is the oh, that what is that application? I don't know what that application is doing. Uh, it's track the location of your phone through a three G network. Oh, it's a three G network. Well, this is three G network. This is in fact a three G network. Like, right? Why can't users just track their phone? Oh, why can't users use these the the this VLR? Yeah. Uh, basically, because it's a kind of proprietary backend database, and they don't want to give you access to it. Yeah, there's nothing. There's no technical reason other than they don't want to give you access to it. That's all. Yeah. Plus, that would only tell you the cell area, right? Yeah, but that gives you a location within about a kilometer. Yeah, it's not very precise, but it's reasonably accurate. I think the iPhone uses GPS. Yeah, so if you have GPS and you keep uploading the iPhone, look at coordinates and GPS. So if you have GPS, you get uh, down to three meters uh, outdoors. Indoors is much worse, but outdoors you can be up to three meters. So other question? <coughs> Okay, uh, I just want to say one more thing and then we'll take a break. And the one more thing I want to say is that I'm going to now tell you a little bit more about what's going on. You notice right away that actually two things going on. Just like in a regular phone, you have to uh, dial before you speak. And when you dial, those messages, which are signaling messages, are being carried on signaling channels. In fact, if you remember the GP GSM, we had those eight slots. So one of those slots, or some of those slots, are marked as signaling channels. And this is what is used to carry messages like, register me, okay, I want to change to another cell tower, or I want to make a call, and this is the number I'm calling, or from the base station comes back to you saying, you know, you just got a call, right, and pick up the phone. So all those are done on signaling channels, okay. Signaling channels have got to exist, otherwise you can't have all these things happen. And the signaling channel also tells you, use this frequency and this time slot for making a call. And this, you know, so you have a pair of frequencies and a pair of time slots for uh, talking to this tower and back from the tower, back to you. So you have a pair. And all that is on a signaling channel. One more thing is carried on signaling channels. One more thing is carried on signaling channels. And what it is is that this, time slot is enough to carry 140 bytes of data. Happens to be the case. Okay. Just enough to carry 140 bytes of data. When the GSM standard was put in, some of the engineers said, ah, why don't we just allow people to send messages on this? As long as it's less than 140 bytes, you just stick it in, and they don't need to use a voice channel. They can use a signaling channel and just piggyback this message in. And they called it short message service. SMS. So the carriers didn't know what to do with it because what's the point? 140 bytes, who needs it? It's not a voice call. They can charge you know, a dollar a minute, talking about, 19, 19, about 1999. And it's too short. Nobody would ever think of restricting the communications to 140 bytes. What a stupid idea. Would you ever want to talk just 140 bytes at a time? I mean, can you imagine that? Email is like 40 kilobytes, 40,000 bytes. Why is anybody in the right mind want to restrict themselves to 140 bytes? Okay. So they said, we'll make it free. And they did this in the Philippines. So they're in the Philippines and they said, if you want to talk, it's going to cost you a lot. But guess what? If you want to use 140 bytes or less, this is junk service, just use it. We don't care because we have the signaling channel. The phone is on and listening to the signaling channel all the time anyway so that it knows does it ring or not. And if you send a message from here to here on this channel saying, you know, ring, the fo ring or uh, vibrate and say you have a message, 140 bytes or less, it costs them nothing. So they said, let's do it. To their amazement, to their absolute shock, everybody went absolutely nuts using this. It was free. So you could take your phone, you could send uh, a text message or SMS to your friend and say, you know, hello, how are you? And that's less than 140 bytes. And they would say, I'm fine, I'll just go back and forth all day, and it wouldn't cost you anything. <laughs> if you say free anything to young people, <laughs> <laughs> they, 
they'll use it. Right? So in the Philippines, where this was introduced, the whole country went text crazy. I should say whole country, meaning all the teenagers went text crazy. But it wasn't used in the US, it wasn't used anywhere else in the world except in the Philippines. But the operators got pretty smart. They said, you know what? It costs us nothing, but let's just charge people, what the hell, let's charge them 20 cents uh, a text message and see whether they'll pay. And guess what? People are willing to pay 20 cents. And uh, so this became a, a, a very, very lucrative thing. When introduced in the US and Canada, they charged 20 cents a text message. People ran up bills of three, four, five thousand dollars on the 20 cents a message. <laughs> and so they introduced plans that would uh, reduce the cost of messages so you could get, I don't know, 5,000 messages for $10 or something like that, or 10,000 messages for $20, something like that. All right, let's talk about uh, roaming and handover a little bit, and, uh, and we'll talk about medium access. So, <clears throat> handover I've talked to you already about, okay? So I'm going to briefly tell you what happens in the other direction, okay? So when a call comes in, that's actually the hard part, okay? Because you need to update the uh, VLR, this is the location register, uh, telling you where you are. And then to call out is very straightforward. You know which base station you're at, you just send a message, I want to make a call, and it just goes through, okay? So that's, and then the handover, when you switch to a new cell, you tell the new station, you update the VLR, okay? And then you change the call over if you're in a call. Roaming is a bit more complicated, so let's say this, this part is, is Rogers, and this part is, uh, let's say you're in a different country, so let's say this is Sprint, and you, you've gone to the United States, and you want to make calls, and you want to uh, receive calls. So let's talk about the receive calls first. So this is your phone, and it's got a 519 number on it, and you just landed in Florida, okay? So what's gonna happen is that Remember that the, the, the channel on which you are going to be broadcasting the uh, beacon is well known. So the phone, as soon as you land, it's going to say, yep, I found Sprint. It's going to show up on your screen. Found Sprint, okay? And you already, most, anyone, anyone of you who's landed in a plane knows when you run where you turn on the phone, it says, yeah, I found this. What happens is that Sprint has made a deal with Rogers, okay? What a deal says is that I'll support roaming for your subscribers, What's actually going on is that the INSI and the IMEI, for that matter, are sent on the signaling network to Rogers, and in the home location register, it's told that it's now here. It's now in this, in, in Sprint, okay? So let's see if somebody makes a call to you. So your friend is still in 519, and they call you. They think you're in 519, so th their call goes from the base station, central office. Central office looks up your location in the HLR and it says, oh, he's not here. He's in Sprint. So it sends it to Sprint. Sprint has your location in their VLR. The cell tower, sorry, the cell tower information is put in, that, in their VLR, okay? So the call from this phone, your friend's phone goes to the HLR, to this VLR, to this base star and rings your phone, okay? And that's how your phone rings. Even if somebody in the local area calls you, that call is first gonna go through here all the way to your home and then back. So it's gonna go all the way. So if you are visiting you know, Prague, for example, and your friend in Prague calls you, that call is gonna to come to Waterloo and then back to Prague, okay? So it's long all the way up back. And uh, the other thing that's going to happen is that because you're roaming, uh, clearly this cell phone provider is going to be uh, providing you services, so they want to be paid for it. And uh, there's a long call involved, so the roaming charges are typically quite high. Okay, the charges are roughly like a you know, dollar a minute or something like that. Again, if you look at the cost, the actual costs of roaming, uh, the actual costs of roaming are probably I don't know, like 0 0.3, 0 0.2 cents a minute. The remaining 99.7 cents is profit. And the reason it's profit is actually fascinating. Rogers is billing you. So you went to the US. So Rogers says, Sprint, those mean people, they're charging us a dollar a minute for your call. So I'm sorry, we just have to pay them a dollar a minute. <laughs> when Sprint customers come to Rogers, 
Sprint says, Rogers, those mean people are charging a dollar a minute. Sorry, you have to pay a dollar. It's not us, it's them that's bad. When you're in your local area, we don't charge you. It's those guys that are bad. In the back room, they're having a lot of fun. <laughs> 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 They're shaking hands and having a big old party because a bunch of the revenue comes from these roaming charges. Okay, and, and so uh, the thing is you have no recourse because you went to Rogers. Rogers said, uh, it's an American company, go sue them. But for instance, I don't know you, you're not my customer. Why should I? I don't know. Who are you? Rogers says, I know who you are, but it's them, it's not me. <laughs> and so if you're traveling anywhere, be sure to, ta to if you don't want to pay roaming charges, uh, turn off your phone, a particular turn off your data plan, because if you have an app that is pulling data in, it's going to incur a lot of charges. So people who've gone on cruises, left the phone on, and come back to a $30,000 phone bill. It's more expensive to have the phone pulling down the email than the cost of the cruise. Okay. So that's roaming, so be careful. And I'll hand over to what I talked about. Yes, Does the HLR just store the information that you're in the VLR? The HLR actually stores your credit information mostly, and uh, there's a lot of other things that it stores. But for now, all you need to know is it stores your credit card information, and it stores which VLR holds you, the local VLR or a remote VLR. If a remote VLR, which remote VLR? And the VLR is actually tracking you as you move. So as you move from base station to base station, the VLR keeps getting updated. Yes. Um, so say I'm a Rogers customer and I am on Sprint's network yeah. um, and Sprint checks that I'm not in their HLR. Right. Do they have to broadcast to all the people they have deals with, like Rogers? No, because you have an IMSI that says you're 519. We know 519 is Rogers. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Yes. Um, so between Rogers and Bell, how do they tell yeah, so uh, we actually use the whole phone number. With, 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 phone, with portability, what you do is you look up not just the prefix, but the whole number. Is that storing the core? Uh, it's a bit complicated, but uh, essentially what happens is there's a shared database that you can look up, okay. and that's enforced with the regulators. So the CRTC in Canada basically says that this is a database of numbers, and this number, your IMSI, belongs to you, not to the phone company, and then you can change the provider. So just, it's just a lot, bigger table to look up. But these days you can do large lookups, it's not a big deal. Yes? So for the roaming, as you said, you are, we are like paying a huge cost of so, but then who's actually getting the revenue? Rogers? Rogers, well, so Rogers gets the revenue from all the Sprint com customers who come to Rogers, and Sprint gets the revenue for all the Rogers customers going there. But it's kind of a, they don't tell you, right? The Sprint may charge you a dollar, they may give 50 cents back to Rogers, we don't know. There's some kind of deal going on, it's not a public deal, we don't know what the deal is. Yeah, Tommy. So there's no incentive for this to change? Like, no. It's just going to be true forever? Yes, it'll be, yeah. So actually, one of my students and I did a game theoretic analysis which showed that this is the right thing to do. I mean, game theoretically, this is the right thing for operator to do. <laughs> and it's not going to change, no. The only thing that can change is through legislation. So in the EU, roaming charges are capped to, I think, 10 euro cents a minute inside Europe. If you roam inside Europe, you have a cap on roaming because it's just getting out of, out of control. But that's because they're all part of EU, right? But if you roam from, say, the US to Europe, there's no ban, there's no, there's no regulation. Yeah. Yes, Ryan. Um, I've noticed anything over 130 bits will, bytes will still turn into two messages. Is there like a header on that file or something? Uh, so strictly speaking, it's 147 bit bytes, not eight bit bytes. So there's some funny stuff going on around there. Uh, it should be, it's actually 167 bit bytes. I want to be even more precise, okay? So it's 148 bit bytes. If it's 130 plus, it could be there's some proprietary header being added, but uh, it should be 148 bit bytes, yeah. Uh, don't ask me about seven bit bytes. It's another story about that. Okay, any other questions about this? Yes, yeah. No, only if you have data plan. If, you're, if you have a voice plan, you can just not pick up the phone and somebody rings you and they won't charge you for that. But if you have a data plan and you're roaming, you will pay data roaming charges. And, but you don't know that, so you, yeah, the data plan can be active when you, when you, when you go somewhere else. Yeah. Okay, I was gonna to talk to you a little bit more about uh, medium access and I'm not going to, all I'll say is that it's a combination of CDM, code division multiplexing, 
and FDM and TDM. And there's one more thing that you, they do, uh, which is called OFDM. I'll just briefly explain this, and then we'll stop. And MIMO. So OK, so let me first explain MIMO. MIMO means multiple in, multiple out. All that means is you have more than one antenna. Okay. So the basic idea is that the transmitter would have, let's say, two antennas, and the receiver has two antennas. Okay. And so you kind of have four paths. So each transmitter can be heard by two receivers. Okay. And so instead of having just one path from a transmitter to receiver, you have four, and that improves your performance because hopefully one of the four is OK, and the other three are bad. Okay. So, so immediately your performance improves, and that allows you to get much better data rates. Okay. And that's how you get much better data rates in 4G. The second thing is called OFDM. And to understand OFDM requires you to understand a little bit of um, Fourier transform theory. So how many of you know Fourier transforms? One, two, three, four. OK. So the three of you can pay attention. The rest of you can uh, go to sleep. When you have a, a pulse, you remember, if you remember this pulse, the transform of, of this in the frequency space is a sync function, right? And the sync function is going to be basically sine x over x. That's the sync function. Oops. So at the base frequency, you have a lot of energy, but you have zeros of the energy at these harmonics in the positive and negative frequency space. So what you do is that if you put another signal which is centered at one of these zero frequencies, you don't have any interference. So these are called subcarriers. And by placing these subcarriers at the right spaces in the frequency domain, you can actually get very little interference between the subcarriers. So you get that for free. So you take a big carrier, and you can split it up into subcarriers. And these are called orthogonal frequencies. And that's why we have orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And with these two, you go from basically 8 kilobits per second up to 100, you know, about a 1 gigabit per second. Okay? In a nutshell, this plus a lot of technology allows you to kind of have this enormous increase in speed. 